Joining us uh, is the author of Christopher Hitchens, What He Got Right, How He Went Wrong, and While He Still Matters. Ben Burgess is a columnist for Jacobin. He joins us today, I believe, from Georgia? Yep. So I didn't keep you waiting, right? No, 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 no. It's I, I, I was very late because my my previous commitment, like I kept thinking, was about to be over, and then it kept not being over. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I, I was only there for a couple minutes. Like I said, I, I didn't want to interrupt, you know, to compound well, my sins by doing that. We have uh, limited time, so very quickly, let's talk about the article you have over at the Daily Beast. Mm-hmm entitled Christopher Hitchens hero to the anti-woke would have hated bans on critical race theory. What is the argument against critical race theory? This is a long tradition of fighting a bogeyman that doesn't exist like, oh, I don't know, uh, Al Qaeda. Like we invented Al Qaeda. We gave Osama bin Laden, the name Al Qaeda. This this critical race theory it exists, but they're not forcing it down the the eyeballs uh, of our students. Yeah, I mean, I think the actual connection between academic critical race theory and anything that's likely to be taught in um, like K twelve schools, for example, in Virginia, which was the last place that had uh, introduced a ban uh when you know when i was writing the article uh is probably pretty tenuous right you know i i don't see you know like i don't see your Derek bells or kimberly crenshaw's you know getting taught in a lot of high school classes in virginia um you know and but i don't want to emphasize that point too much because for two reasons right one is that you know people who are obsessed with this you know all of these like little petty cops like james Lindsay and christopher rufo you know, who spend all their time thinking about this, they'll find examples of things that if you look at them in the right light, they sound kind of sort of like critical race theory. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they they could make a big deal about that. And I think that's sort of like taking your eye off the ball of the bigger issue, because even if we imagine that we were living in a world where, you know, Derek Bell, for example, a really important critical race theorist was being taught regularly in Virginia high school classrooms. He actually, there actually are things like, you know, I mean, look, most high schools suck, so they're not going to teach it, you know, but like uh, there are things that Derek Bell wrote that you could assign in a high school classroom that are like relatively, you know, that are like accessible enough and things like that. Like people sometimes overstate this point and say like nothing that any of these guys say could possibly be comprehended outside of like, you know, graduate school or law school. That's not really true, right? I mean, like they did, they did write some things that are, you know, I mean, Derek Bell wrote some like short stories to like try to illustrate some of his ideas. Uh, and and you could actually assign one of those to a high school classroom. And my point would be, if you did, so what? Like if if you know, like like I I think that like what somebody like you know Derek Bell or Kimberly Crenshaw believes about race and all of that, you know, I agree with certain parts of it. I disagree with certain parts of it. But my view is that the role of education should uh, should be to make people better at critical thinking, so they can. You know they could engage with ideas and and figure what out what they, they think what, what, what are these laws being passed are they banning discussions about the evils of slavery or well, are, it's, are it's, most, it seems to me that you're going to make a white kid uncomfortable if you talk about the middle passage yeah so uh in, in some you cases i think in some cases, I think they do shade into uh, to that, right? So I, I could I actually have right in front of me a bill that was introduced uh, a uh, a few days ago, I think, or at least it was posted about a few days ago in New Hampshire, uh, which is um, which uh, which says uh, New Hampshire, not the South, not yeah, the old. Yeah, the, Confederacy. No, no, this is not the old Confederacy. This is New Hampshire, right? So, so let me let me just read a little bit of this. Um, and, and some of this, I guess, is actually adding to an older law, but like quite a bit of what I'm reading is, is, is like new stuff that, you know, that this, this new bill that's been proposed would add to it. Right. So here's, here's how it starts. 
Uh, one, no teacher shall advocate communism, socialism, or Marxism as a political doctrine or theory, which includes the overthrow by force of the United States or of this state at any public approved school or at any state institution. Two, the, and this part, like that part was like partially old, partially new. Uh, two, no teacher shall advocate any doctrine or theory promoting a negative account or representation of the founding and history of the United States of America, New Hampshire Public Schools, uh, which does not include the worldwide context of now outdated and discouraged practices. I guess slavery is a now discouraged practice. Uh, such uh, prohibition includes, but is not limited to teaching that the United States was founded on racism. So, you know, that like some of this, uh, I mean, beyond just the fact that like the sort of general like spirit of it is, is just like this kind of wild neo-McCarthy, you know, authoritarian hysteria, uh, which it is, uh, but like, you know, I, it's also, I, I imagine myself, like if this is passed, right? I don't think this law that, you know, I think this is just introduced. I don't think this is passed yet. Like this one I was just reading from, but like, if this is passed, and like, if I'm a public school teacher in New Hampshire, then what I have to think about is not just like what the technical wording of the law is, but anytime I talk about anything that flies too close to the sun of these topics, is anything that's gonna come out of my mouth something that, an, uh, that if the wrong student repeated it to their parents, that an unsympathetic parent took this to the school board, would I get in trouble? Would there be a whole thing here? You know, would there be the possibility of disciplinary action or be having to explain myself to avoid disciplinary action? And I have to think realistically, most people in that position are just gonna start avoiding these topics as much as possible because it's not worth the headache, which is of course kind of the goal, right? You know, to, to, to shut that down. And that's, and you know, I, I think that it's, I think it's terrible from, you know, whatever you think about the motivations, and we can talk about that, but whatever you think about the motivations, I think the effect of this is going to be absolutely terrible in terms of, you know, so many high schools are already these incredibly boring conformity factories that don't really do much to promote critical thinking, that don't really, you know, expose students to interested ideas and interested discussions and, and help them, you know, and, and, and help them like expand their minds. And, and I think this is just going to make that problem way worse because, because of course, right, like, like what you, you know, this is that, what does it mean to present the United States as having been founded on racism? Assuming that you don't actually use the words, the United States was founded on racism, that like nobody could catch you using those exact words. Then the question is, what well, are you saying something that could be summarized? is saying that the United States could be founded on racism. I would imagine different districts are gonna interpret this differently. I would imagine that like different parents are, are, are going to seize on things, you know, and, and, and you're gonna get at the very least a lot of fighting about this uh, that is going to have a chilling effect on, on teachers. And, and I think that the reason I, you know, I said in the piece, right, you know, that, that I was arguing that Christopher Hitch, who, you know, you know, part of the reason I was talking, I mean, of course, I wanted to talk to him about it because I just wrote a book about him. But like part of the reason that the Daily Beast thought it'd be an interesting angle is that this is a guy who, you know, a certain kind of proponent of these laws, you know, likes, you know, you're like James Lindsay types. And, uh, and I think that there, are, you know, even though, of course, anytime you play the game of what would somebody have thought about something that they never, you know, they didn't live to, right? You know, there's always a speculative element. I think in this case, we could actually be pretty confident based on two things, right? One of them is his substantive views about the topic, that even in his worst political period, post 9-11, uh, Christopher Hitchens was on record as supporting reparations for slavery. So I think that his reaction to the idea that you weren't allowed to say in a classroom, anything that could be glossed is that the United States was founded on racism would have been pretty bad. And, and two, uh, I think what might in some ways be the more significant issue, uh, which is the issue about free speech and open, you know, open and unafraid discussion of controversial ideas, because this is something that was very important to him. And, and he had, I think, one of the best business debate that he did in Canada in like the last few years of his life. You could find on YouTube, you know, just search for like Christopher Hitchens free speech, uh, which is, I think, one of the best sort of most eloquently stated versions of this argument I've ever heard, where he starts out, 
you know, he does this classic Christopher Hitchens opening, you know, where, where I think the first word out of his mouth is fire. And it's like, okay, now you've heard it, right? Fire, not a crowd theater, granted. Uh, and he, he says, and he reminds the audience that the context of Oliver Wendell Holmes saying that you can't shout fire at a crowded theater was upholding the conviction of a group of socialists who had been passing out Yiddish language anti-war literature opposing US entry into World War I. And the, the point that Hitchens makes is, well, look, um, you could make a good argument that these people were in fact shouting fire when there was a very real fire, you know, they, they were firefighters. Uh, and the question as always with these free speech issues is who gets to decide, right? Who is empowered to decide what counts as a real fire and what doesn't? And how sure are you that they're gonna make the right decision? And, and I think that, you know, when it comes to this stuff, I mean, like, I, I, I think that you have to say, like, I mean, you know, maybe this is naive of me, but like, I think that I, you know, I can remember being in high school and having a high school teacher, I can remember reading things I disagreed with. I can remember high school teachers saying things I disagreed with. You know, I think that like a good teacher presents ideas as like prompts for discussion, not like dogmatically, this is what you have to think. But I also remember, you know, teachers just asserting things that I didn't agree with. And I didn't just automatically start believing everything because a teacher says they would. And I really don't believe like, you know, I talk to some teachers. I don't believe that they, you know, that they are under any illusions, that they have that level of control over their students' minds, you know, that they, they present people with things and, you know, what they're going to do with that is, is ultimately something that over the years is, is, you know, like teachers have very limited control over, but I'm much happier living in a society where things that like some like, you know, petty school board fascists could decide oh, that sounds like Marxism to me. That sounds like saying that the United States was founded on racism to me. I'm much happier living in a society where people are allowed to decide these things for themselves. And, you know, teachers could do what they think is going to be best for stimulating discussion in their classroom without people peering over their shoulders and, and, and asking, you know, what, what's, uh, you know, like, oh, wait a second, is that, does that suggest the United States was founded on racism? Is, is that, I don't know. I mean, did you say something about the triangle shirtwaist factor? That could be interpreted as Marxism. You know, like, like I, I, I don't, I don't want to live in that world. And, and I think that like a really crucial point about this, I also think there's a strategic discussion to be had here because overwhelmingly the response of the left to these laws has basically been to call people racist for supporting them, which I don't think is always wrong. I think, I think some people who are really pushing this stuff are pretty racist, but I don't think that's necessarily the most politically salient truth because one, if that's your only response, it's not going to ring true to a lot of people because even though I understand that like if you speak online progressive instead of American English, you know, you, you know, you will define the word racism in such a way that you don't have to be like consciously bigoted to be a racist, but that's not how most people understand the term and they know they understand perfectly well. There are going to be people who support these laws who aren't consciously super racist. And also I think it sort of contributes to the image of, of you know, the left and progressives as, as, you know, as like being very finger waggy. I think the better way to respond to this is to say, look, these people are just cops, right? This is just like, like this critical race theory freak out. This is just the 2022 version of like people at like school board meetings in 1975 say that if you play Zeppelin records backwards, it says hail Satan. You know, I mean, it's, it, it, it's just, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's just the latest version, you know, people in the 1980s saying that, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, was, was, was. Or, you know, or we have, we have to wrap it up or it's the same people from 1975 who didn't want their kids bust in, in South Boston. It might, it might be more than that, but we have yeah, to wrap it up. There's, de there's definitely an element of that. Yep. Right. Uh, Professor Ben Burgess is author of Christopher Hitchens, what he got right how he went wrong and why he still matters. He writes about this over at the Daily Beast. He is also a columnist for Jacobin and host of Give Them an Argument. I wish we had more time. Thank yes. you, Professor. All right. Thank you so much, David. Thank you.